Okay, our next speaker is uh, Chris John Mayer, uh, who will be presenting the commissioning and calibration of the Daniel K. Inouye te uh, Solar Telescope in Maui. Chris is a senior software engineer with the National Solar Observatory in Maui. He is responsible for the integration of the control systems of the telescope and its subsystems. He has worked at the observatories in the Canaries and Hawaii and was work package manager for the Gemini Telescope Control System. He be first became involved with the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope in 2004 whilst at Observatory Sciences Limited. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to talk today about the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, uh, which is being built on Maui at the moment. Um, it was formerly known as the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, but was named after the former um, Hawaii Senator, Daniel K. Inouye. Um, it's a very exciting time for the project at the moment because um, we've had all the final deliveries of the large pieces of equipment for the telescope. In particular, just a few months ago, the primary mirror was delivered to the summit. So all the, all the stuff we need to build this telescope is now there. And we've got now a two-year period. Um, by the end of 2019, uh, the telescope will be uh, commissioned, integrated and handed over for operations. Um, for this talk, I'll divide it into sort of three parts. Um, the first part, I'll tell you a bit about the telescope, um, um, because probably most, most of you don't know anything about it. Um, I'll then tell you something about the control software that's been presented at iCollapse um, in, in previous years. And then finally, I'll go on to some of the first uh, tests we're doing on the equipment, the site acceptance tests we've done on one of the first pieces of equipment to be delivered, and some description of how we're going to uh, calibrate and commission the telescope. And particularly, the important things of pointing the telescope in the right direction and getting the primary mirror in the right shape so that we get a good image eventually when, we, when the telescope is fi finally finished. So I suppose the first question is, why build a telescope four meters to observe the sun? Um, we do that because we need the resolution. Um, typical scales on the solar surface, which we're interested in, are about 70 kilometers. And for that, you need a resolution of about 0.1 arc seconds. Um, so to reach those sort of uh, resolutions, you need a large mirror just to get down to that sort of resolution. And the other reason is, the solar surface is dynamic, it's constantly changing, so if you want to take images and don't want those features of the surface to be smeared out, then what you need to do is take images quite fast, and therefore you're limited in the amount of time you can take your exposures. So that's why we build a four meter solar telescope. Okay, here is the telescope. Oh, it's a cutout here, just to show you. Um, is this the pointer? Yeah. Um, the light beam, but not very clear here, it comes down here through this sort of yellow here onto the primary mirror. As, the pre as was described in the SCAR, SKA mid, this is an off-axis Gregorian telescope. So even though by nighttime telescopes, a four-meter mirror now is not that large, this is a four-meter mirror, which is a piece of a 12-meter mirror offset by four meters so it's an off-axis, and because of that, the telescope is actually very large and very big. This is 44 meters up here. The other reason it's so tall is underneath here, we have the Coude Laboratory where all the science will be done. It's where all the instruments will go down here. Um, so the light beam comes down here, hits the primary mirror up to the secondary mirror. There's a whole slew of mirrors then up to M6, which brings the light above the, uh, uh, the azimuth axis and then down through here into the Coude laboratory where, we'll, where, we, where the instruments are. And so it's, as we say here, it's a four meter telescope. It's all, it's all reflecting, so we, get very, we can observe right across a whole optical into the near infrared. We have facility, light, uh, facility class instruments. I'll look, just explain some of those in a minute. Um, and we have a site with excellent seeing. Um, slide. So here we are down now in the Cude laboratory. And the light beam now is coming down here onto M7, M8, M9. And finally, we get to M10, which is a deformable mirror. This is 210 millimeters across, and it's got 1,600 actuators on it, which we use to get to the resolutions we need for the, um, to do adaptive optics with this telescope. And then all the instruments are here in this um, Coude lab. We have a visible imager, um, red and blue arm, 
we have two uh, near-infrared spectropolarimeters, one cryogenic and one uh, diffraction limited, and we have a visible in, um, uh, spectropolarimeter as well. And so all the instruments down here, this is where all the science of the telescope will be done. And so it's sort of a bit like an accelerator. We got the beam. The, uh, solar astronomers, they don't like being called astronomers, they want to be called solar physicists, and they do experiments, they don't do observations. And uh, so once they've got the beam here, you can observe with multiple instruments at the same time. Um, the light is split with by dichroics to different instruments, and so you can do multi um, multi-instrument, multi-wavelength observations at the same time. And so, why do we go to Hawaii, other than the beaches and the Mai Tais, of course? It's because of the, if we look here, if you do this experiment at sea level, or anywhere, at most sites, and try and put your thumb up across the sun, you get something like this. You get this really bright halo all around the side. Here's the Daniel K. Anui Solar Telescope. You do the same thing on Haleakala, which is the, the mountain on which it, the, the, the telescope is built. And you can basically block out the whole sun with your thumb at arm's length like that. And you can see there's a very... F and so when we're observing into the corona off, off the sun's surface, we've got the low scattered light that we need to do coronal observations. So now something about the control system. This has been presented before at different uh, ICOLEPS and SPIE. It's a fairly standard. We have a hierarchical uh, system. The observatory control system is at the top. Um, it controls three main systems, the telescope control system, the data handling system, and the instrument control system. So this, there's one system here, but this, there are actually multiple instrument control, um, and I've just shown here two of the instruments, the, the, uh, or one of the instruments, the visible broadband imager, and that has the camera system software associated with it. Um, uh, the telescope control system is what I'm more in, um, involved with, and you can see that consists of a number of different systems, one for the mirror, M1 mirror control. Uh, somewhere down there is the enclosure control system. So we have a fairly standard hierarchical system. Um, and um, the software that was used for the control system was developed for DKIST, but inspired by the Alma Common software um, with a container and component model. So we have containers here outside which have uh, components inside, and they share a toolbox which provides them with services, shared services or private service tools. And so with this structure, we can bring up and down the software. It goes through a standard set of life cycle states when we, we, we launch the software and we shut it down in the same way. So all the components of the telescope, the software components, obey this pattern. They have this um, with a container. And if we look at one example, um, oh, sorry, first of all, um, these are the typical services we use. Um, we have the, all the standard ones. We have logging. So all logging is done in, the same, in a standard way, recording messages to a permanent store. Um, another important service is the event service, which is publish, subscribe, so our components can publish their data to the outside world. Um, and um, a property service is the other key one, perhaps, there, where we can configure our components in different ways and keep static data in there. So just to say a quick example of the telescope control system, this is the uh, TCS application, and it has three, the green is the containers, um, and inside these are the different components. Um, configurations come down into the top level, a uh, component here, and are split up and passed down to the other components. Um, and then events are public. Uh, these communicate via events as well, and then events are published to the outside world so the rest of the system can to monitor what the telescope control system can do. So in terms of uh, integration and QA, um, we've heard from several talks this, this week um, about simulation, and all our control systems are delivered with simulators. So the telescope control system was delivered first, and it had simulators for each of its subcomponents. Then gradually, as those um, subsystems were delivered by vendors and partners, those um, uh, real systems were plugged in. But of course, they have their own simulation. Obviously, we don't have the hardware. So we have an end-to-end -end simulator in Tucson, uh, and another in Boulder, where we can run the whole system um, um, and, and integrate all the components before we ever get to the telescope site. 
Um, the other thing we can do is we have a QA system which each night spawns virtual machines and runs the automated tests. So if you check in your new code, that, that, that will be run that night and you'll get a report the next day whether you've broken anything, etc. And um, that was presented in a poster on Tuesday. And if you have a look, that's there. You can see some further details about that system there. So going on to commissioning and integrating, the, the, whole, the whole integration process is divided up into what we call system integration modules. And there are a whole load of these. Um, the important ones, well, they're all important, but this is one we're aiming for when we get to first light, first time we get light, solar light, through the telescope onto the instruments. And the final is when we can finally get down to multi-instrument verification, where we have multiple instruments working together. Um, for the work, I'm going to, the exp explanation I'm going to do about what we've done so far, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the telescope pointing map, the first part, and M1 integration. These are the f two things we've got to get done first. So each of those SIMs is, it has a flowchart associated with it. You probably can't read that. But each of these flowcharts has some rectangular blocks here, which are independent activities. We also have some these uh, rhomboids here, which are pre-requirement, which are uh, sorry, these these here are uh, preconditions that have to happen before we can get move on. So, for example, there's a precondition here. This is a telescope mount assembly that has to all be checked out and ready before we can even start that. And then we have these activities in here, um, and then at the end we have a, 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 a criteria for having completed that integration of that particular piece. Um, represented here and also at the end this is when that whole uh, system integration block is finished and complete and we can move on to another one. So we'll talk a little bit now about the commissioning and testing we've just started um, and um, if I have time I'll talk about image jitter um, which is very important we've got to keep the jitter down very low for the telescope, um, some pointing tests and open, look, open loop lookup tables which we use to calibrate the primary mirror when we don't have feedback from the wavefront sensor control system. And I don't think I'll probably get as far as they were called at system calibration. So image jitter. Um, this, is to, this is the first thing we, we wanted to do was the QDA laboratory which I showed you earlier with the instruments. Um, we have to keep the image jitter down from all sources from the mechanics of the telescope to about 75 milli arc seconds. And um, how do we do that without having um, an image to, to look at, to, to measure? And so what we have done is instrumented the CUDE with, um, obviously it has its encoders, but we also with accelerometers. And then by looking at the accelerometers and converting them into image, um, actual physical motion of the CUDE and going through the optics model, we can work out what the, um, the, uh, the image jitter will finally be. And when the telescope was assembled, the CUDE was assembled in the factory um, in Rockford in um, Illinois, uh, it was a full assembly of the whole system, the results they got from the mount were about 17 milli arc seconds and 5 milli arc seconds for the CUDE. So they were below, the, obviously that's the contribution from these, we've got to get the whole contribution from all the other things, the pumps and everything, it's all got to be below 75 milli arc seconds. When we did this on site, we had a much better result, um, and we got down to about half a milli arc second. And what we did, we assume a rigid body rotation. Um, this is the coup day here, and basically it rocks backwards and forwards. Here is the accelerometer output um, from four different accelerometers on the, on the coup day, and these are all measuring in the same direction, and you can see here, um, this is the frequency response function of the, the coup day, at this frequency here, about 11 hertz, all the accelerometers went the same way. So the whole, this is the rigid body motion. And so using that and the optics model, we can predict that the, the jitter from when the telescope is moving is down below half a milli arc second from that, from that one contribution. And here we have um, output of the accelerometers when the telescope is first slewing, and we get quite a large a jitter here. I mean, I say large, but this is down. This is this is ten to the minus three up here, and so down here we're down at um, half a milli arc second. So that's good, a good initial result. But if at that point the coup day is very lightly loaded, 
and also it's, uh, it's very balanced. When all the instruments on, that will not be the case, but it's a good, a good first start. So for pointing tests, we've got to be able to point the telescope to 1.7 arc seconds RMS all over the sky, and the sun is not a very good pointing target. Um, you, um, the, the telescope only sees five arc minutes at the center of the, uh, uh, anywhere on the sun at one time. And so for pointing tests, we're going to do nighttime pointing initially with a nighttime alignment telescope. And, um, um, and, um, and eventually, the light will be taken all the way down into the, into the CUDE onto the wavefront sensor. And it has a context camera where we can always, and we will do the final pointing test there. But the initial pointing test will be done on with a nighttime alignment telescope mounted onto the frame of the, um, of the telescope itself. And so what we do there is we, have a, we, we look at a selection of stars. Um, here's a projection of stars onto, the, onto a plane. Select the stars. We then align them to a reference position. Um, we log the data. And then from the analysis of the data, we generate a pointing model. So there we'll, once we've gone through that process, we should be able to point the telescope um, to a few arc seconds RMS anywhere on the sky when we are, when we're, and we need that good pointing because when we don't have a wavefront sensor giving us feedback, we're relying on open loop tracking when, when you're really dependent on how well the telescope can point in absolute terms. Sorry. Yeah, just finishing. <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, I can finish there if, if, if it's really... Yes. Okay. I'll just finish this one slide then. To to get the um, the, uh, the the shape of the mirror correctly, we um, we need um, we need to look. At, uh, we, we, it's, uh, it's a very thin mirror, 75 millimeters thin, and over four meters. So it's actively controlled, and so we need initially to get the um, to to calibrate. That, the shape of that mirror as a function of elevation. And we'll do that initially by looking at Polaris. Polaris is at be about 20 degrees above the horizon in, at, on Hawaii, and it's essentially at a fixed position. So the initial measurements will be done with a, a wavefront sensor at prime focus. We have a model, an optics model, of what we expect to see there. And we're taking measurements at a grid of positions in X, Y, and Z. We'll fit that and determine the, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the wavefront. Uh, we'll measure the wavefront at that position and then do that. Once we've got it at Polaris, we'll then do it at different elevations and generate some open loop lookup tables, which will um, be used uh, as a telescope moves in elevation to correct the primary mirror to keep its perfect shape so we get very good images as well as good pointing. Sorry, I've overrun, but I'll finish now if anyone's got any questions.